welcome all. So, uh, we are in the process of learning about the flotation cost and in the previous class I discussed with you that how the flotation cost can be uh, taken care of and can be say uh, adjusted in the uh, total uh, uh, cost of capital. So, we discussed the uh, two approaches in the previous class and uh, 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 say uh, the first approach was that we can uh, use uh, this particular uh, process a revised uh, walking uh, this weighted average cost of capital and we can uh, jack up the uh, say WACC that is our uh, um, say weighted average cost of capital and uh, uh, say that way it will be uh, say, uh, uh, say going up. For example, we saw that if it is uh, 12 percent then uh, if we add up the flotation cost of the 6 percent also it will become as the 12.77 percent, but that is a wrong approach uh, because uh, uh, the flotation cost is not the annual cost, it is the one time cost. So, the second approach which we discussed in the previous class that uh, I, I suggested you that yes is better that uh, the flotation cost must be added into the cost of the project in the total cash outflows. So, that uh, uh, means it is a one time cost and the cash outflow is also the one time outflow. So, the total uh, outflow we have to work out uh, by adjusting the flotation cost and jacking up the total cash outflow means the total cost of the project or the total cost of establishing that business unit or that, that project. So, uh, second approach I suggested you is much better and uh, to means understand the second approach well we uh, did this problem and then uh, we try to understand that how we can uh, say jack up the project cost. So, we have seen that in that process the project costs became uh, uh, 217.39 million and 17.39 million was the flotation cost. So, I think that seems to be a better analogy because being a one time cost you add it up into the project cost and then when we recover the say uh, total project cost through the cash inflows or the project cash inflows then we have not to recover only 200 million. Uh, in the present value terms, but the 217.39 million. So, being a one time cost it should be adjusted uh, in the project cost not in the uh, weighted average cost of capital right. So, we discussed these two approaches in the previous class fine, but here now the uh, million dollar question is that when I discuss this problem with you that when we uh, say agreed that the flotation cost is 8 percent and then the sale uh, say final capital proceeds will be left with us is a 92 percent right. So, we have to make it as the 100 percent. So, we have to jack up the total project costs, but there I only talked to you uh, uh, was that is uh, please look at this the company is considering a rupees 200 million expansion uh, project which will be funded by selling the additional equity by selling the additional equity. It means in this particular problem in this particular case I considered only one source of funding. I considered only one source of funding that is a equity capital, but you would agree with me that in practice it is not only one source of funding, but the capital to be invested in the projects comes from the different sources right. And normally we have the four different sources, uh, two are the internal sources which are the say retained earnings then the equity capital uh, to be issued to the equity shareholders. These are two we consider for calculating the cost of capital. We consider these two as the internal sources of funds and then the th two external sources of funds preference capital and the debt capital. So, uh, preference capital is also considered is uh, as, as good as the debt capital or like a external source of fund for calculating the cost of capital because the approach of calculating the cost of capital for the preference capital is as same as the say approach of calculating the cost of debt capital or the borrowed capital. So, we have means minimum 4 sources or at least 3 sources not one source not entire capital is going to come from the equity it is going to come from different sources at least there has to be a appropriate mix of the debt and equity. So, if that is the case then how we have to calculate the or how we have to adjust the flotation cost. So, in that situation uh, if for example, the capital is coming not from one source only equity if it is coming from multiple sources internal and external. So, it means the flotation cost has to be incurred in the same way we have to incur the flotation cost on the equity we have to incur the flotation cost on the preference capital we have to uh, say incur the flotation cost on the debt. 
So, uh, it means when the flotation cost is associated to all the say 3 sources, minimum 3 sources of the finance, then certainly we have to take care of the total flotation cost associated to the 3 sources of, of the finance. So, simple flotation cost as we learned to calculate in, in the previous class will not work. In that case, we will have to work out the weighted uh, 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 average flotation cost. In that case, we have to calculate the weighted average flotation cost and we have to uh, find out how much flotation cost is required for equity, for the preference capital, for the debt capital and then we have to say uh, calculate the weighted average flotation cost to arrive at the say the final uh, cost you can call it as that is a weighted average flotation cost we have to take into account, we have to calculate and then finally, we have to adjust uh, that cost into the total cost of the project. We will be adding up into the total cost of the project as we have seen that uh, in the previous case it became 217.39 million against the normal cash flows required of the 200. So, 17.39 was the uh, flotation cost. So, same way we will be adding now the flotation cost again in the cash flows of the 200 million, but this will be the weighted average flotation cost not as the say simple flotation cost. So, how to calculate the weighted average flotation cost? Let us understand that. Uh, the, the process of calculating the weighted average flotation cost is something like this, where we call it as F A, uh, we call it as F A uh, here. F A is equal to W R F R W R F R plus uh, W E F E W E F E plus W P F P plus W uh, D F D W D F D. So, this way you can calculate the F A. So, what is F A now? F A is basically the weighted average flotation cost. F A is the weighted average flotation cost and this will be calculated by taking care of all the different sources. So, we have taken the 4 sources here, one source is the retained earnings, W R means the proportion of the retained earnings and the flotation cost associated to the retained earnings that is the say a component that is becoming W R multiplied by the F R. Then plus say the proportion of the equity capital and the flotation cost associated to the equity capital. Similarly, the preference capital, so proportion W P is the proportion of the preference capital, F P is the say, uh, say the proportion of the uh, you call it as a uh, say flotation cost for raising the preference capital and W D is the proportion of the debt capital and the F D is the say uh, proportion of the flotation cost associated to that right. So, in this case we have to now find out the weightage of the different sources of the funds or the funds coming from different sources. So, what is the respective weightage of that and then we have to uh, say at the same time ascertain the say uh, source wise flotation cost also. So, number 1 you have to find out the say source wise the uh, say proportion of the funds and then the source wise the say proportion of the total flotation cost. So, so that by multiplying the source of fund or the proportion of the source of fund with the proportion of the flotation cost and then summing up all the sources and the products of the sources and the flotation cost together we can calculate the weighted average flotation cost. So, we assume here for example, we let us take now the figures uh, um, uh, for example, the company again I assume is the X, Y, Z limited right. This is the company and they want to raise the capital for the new project and uh, we are given here whatever that capital amount is going to be the weights are given to us and here are given the uh, WR, the WR is given to us as the say 20 percent. Then we are given that WE and WE is the uh, say 30 percent and then we are given the weight uh, WP, WP is equal to uh, 10 percent and then we have got the say proportion of the debt and W uh, D is 40 percent. So, this becomes how much? This becomes 100 percent, this total becomes 1. So, it means the proportions are 20 percent is coming from the retained earnings, 30 percent is coming from the equity capital and uh, 10 percent is coming from the preference capital and then the debt uh, proportion is 40 percent, right. And now, we have calculated, uh, calculated the, uh, we have found it, uh, found it out that the uh, flotation cost, right. 
So, flotation cost is uh, to be uh, found out here. So, if you talk about the say, flotation cost here, <coughs> uh, in case of the retained earnings, when you talk about the FR, we have taken here the FR. So, FR is 0 because normally there is no flotation cost for the retained earnings. As I have discussed with you while talking about the flotation cost that in the internal sources of the finance when the retained earnings are concerned there is no flotation cost because these funds are easily available with us as the free reserves. So, we can make use of uh, those uh, funds. So, no flotation cost has to be paid. So, FR is 0 we have uh, say assumed here then FE flotation cost with regard to the equity is given to us and that cost is the 10 percent right and next thing is the flotation cost with regard to the uh, preference capital FP is given to us and the FP amount is 5 percent this is the 5 percent and finally is the flotation cost associated to the debt and that cost is 4 percent right. So, these costs are given to us the retained earnings is 0 and uh, equity is 10 percent preference is 5 percent and debt is the 4 percent right. So, our job is now to calculate the FA right. We have to calculate the FA or the flotation cost. So, for calculating the flotation cost we have to now find out the product of these 4 and then we have to add it up. So, flotation cost is FA is going to be how much? This is going to be uh, what is the first proportion? This is 220 percent and then we have to multiply it by something and that is 0 right. So, uh, we are going to calculate now the weighted average flotation cost FA is basically the weighted average flotation cost. Second source is the uh, your equity capital which is how much 30 percent and the cost associated to that is 10 right and then next is the say uh, next proportion is uh, 10 percent and the cost associated to that is how much 5 and then is the uh, next cost is the debt cost or the debt component or the source of fund is the debt. So, it means this amount is uh, uh, say again 40 percent and the cost associated to this is 4 right. So, it means if you uh, try to take it up you can find out here is that uh, the cost associated to these are uh, say 0 for the retained earnings, 10 percent for the uh, say equity capital uh, and then 5 percent for the preference capital and the 4 percent cost is for the say your uh, the debt capital. So, if you calculate the product of these, so you can find out the FA is going to be uh, FA is going to be 5.1 percent, FA is going to be 5.1 percent. So, this is called as the weighted average flotation cost 5 percent is the uh, flotation cost. So, it means now what we have to do is we have to as I told you like as we did it in the second case that we have to add up this cost into the total project cost. So, what does it mean that when we are to say add the project uh, this flotation cost into the project cost. So, uh, we have to adjust it like this how we have to adjust it we have to adjust it like this 1 by 1 minus uh, this is how much. Uh, uh, point this is the uh, how much 5.1 percent. So, it is 0 0.051 right 0 0.051. So, it means the if you if you solve this this works out as this works out as uh, rupees 1.054. Now, what does it mean? This, this figure has come up after adjusting the flotation cost we have got this figure that is 1.054. It means uh, this indicates this figure indicates actually after adjusting the flotation cost for all the four sources of the funds. We have got this one uh, figure which is called as 1.054. It means for raising every rupee of investment or for the purpose of investment in the project we have to raise 1.054 uh, 1 rupees right. So, every rupee of investment every rupee of investment requires raising of the 1.054 rupees it means it means that uh, miss uh, uh, only the investment requirement is 1 rupee, but we are going to raise to meet that investment requirement. So, that 1 rupee is available as 1 rupee we are going to raise not only 1 rupee from the market we are going to raise 1.054 rupees. So, you can say that for every rupee of investment for every rupee of investment we have to raise now 1.054 rupees. So, it means this uh, 0.054 is basically the flotation cost component. 
So, it means if you want to raise 200 million uh, rupees for investment in the project, you have to multiply by this factor and accordingly whatever the amount comes up is that amount we have to raise. right? So, if you have to raise means the total amount you have to raise is that is including the weighted average uh, flotation cost. So, finally, means the right approach what we discussed is the right approach is you add up the flotation cost into the total project cost, but at the limitation of the previous second method which we discussed was we considered only one source that is the capital is coming from equity, but in the real sense the capital comes from the different sources. So, in this uh, say, uh, say uh, the improvement of upon the second uh, method we uh, discussed in this class and we found it we assumed that there are the four sources from where the capital is coming and uh, all the four sources have some flotation cost. So, we have to calculate the weighted average flotation cost and finally, when we calculated the weighted average flotation cost, we got one factor and that factor was 1 point means after adjusting the weighted average flotation cost, we got one factor and that factor was 1.054. So, it means now we have got an idea that whatever the investment we want to make whether it is 200 million, 300 million, 400 million or 100 million for every rupee of investment required to be made in the project, you have to raise 1.054 rupees. So, that 0.054 rupees are the flotation cost, we have already added into the total investment required. Uh, for the uh, total investment required for this project. So, it means after raising this much of the amount you will have 1 rupee means at least 1 rupee available for making investment in the project. So, if you want to raise the 200 millions for the, the project cost is 200 million multiply by this factor. So, you can get that much of the amount. So, after paying the even the flotation cost after paying the flotation cost at the rate of 5.1 percent we will be sufficiently left with the 200 million rupees which can be invested in the project. So, it is not the case that only 92 rupees will be available out of 100 rupees because 8 percent is the flotation cost. Since we have adjusted into the total cost of the project, so now in this case every amount we want to raise you multiply it by this factor and you will get the total amount including the flotation cost. So, even after paying the flotation cost you will be left with the sufficient amount which is required to be invested in the project according to the cost of the project. Right. So, this is a concept of the flotation cost, we discussed the three situations, one situation was the flotation cost is there and first situation was how to adjust the flotation cost. So, we uh, saw that it can be added into the WACC, so we can jack up the WACC, but for the reasons discussed in the previous class we found that is a wrong approach right? because it is not the annual cost. So, we, we found out the second approach, second approach was that we have to add up the flotation cost into the total project costs or into the total cash outflows. So, that is a correct approach, but the limitation of the method we discussed in the previous class was we considered only one source of finance that is equity capital, whereas in the real sense, whereas in the real sense capital comes from the different sources. So, we in this class we removed that limitation also we created a situation where we assumed that there are the four different sources from where the funds are coming all the four sources we have identified the flotation cost also then we calculated the weighted average flotation cost and we got one factor we got the weighted average flotation cost that is 5.1 percent and with the help of that we got one factor that was rupees 1.054. So, it means now with the help of this factor you can find out any amount whatever the amount is required to be invested in the project that uh, will be multiplied by this factor. So, you are not going to raise that much of, of the amount, but plus for that means uh, say uh, the amount for the flotation cost also. So, finally, I would say that for every rupee of investment so are required to be made uh, uh, to be invested in the project for every rupee that is required to be invested in the project we have to raise 1.054 rupees. So, this is the concept of the flotation cost how we calculate the normal flota flotation cost, how we calculated the weighted average flotation cost and how we uh, say adjust that in the total cost of the project. Right. Now, I am going to conclude discussion on this uh, say cost of capital, but uh, means uh, as the concluding remarks we have to discuss some uh, uh, other important concepts also and the last part of the discussion on the cost of capital is that some misconceptions with regard to the cost of capital, some misconceptions with regard to the cost of capital and uh, the misconceptions here are first misconception is that cost of capital is too academic 
and or impractical means in the real sense uh, projects or the firms while making investment into the new uh, projects they never calculate the cost of capital it is only a academic issue impractical issue and we should not care for that. But this is wrong this is a misconception this is a practical issue and practically the firms so many surveys have been conducted over a period of time. Uh, the book which I am referring here for this discussion uh, uh, financial management of Prasanna Chandra in uh, almost every chapter he has given reported the findings of the surveys where the researchers have conducted the research and they have found out which method or different methods are used by the firms in the practical sense to calculate the cost of capital. So, it means it is not academic issue it is the practical issue and it is always useful always the weighted average cost of capital is calculated and that plays the role of say calculating the discounted cash flows. Second misconception is the cost of equity is equal to the dividend rate or return on equity this is not the dividend rate cost of capital is not simply the dividend rate cost of capital is the required rate of return by the equity investors or the equity shareholders it is a required rate of return and dividend rate is not the required rate of return. Dividend depends upon the profitability of the company and uh, I said depending upon the profitability board of directors decide every year in the annual general meeting or maybe before the annual general meeting board of directors decide and they announce in the AGM that this much of the dividend is being paid. So, sometimes they pay high amount of dividend sometimes low amount of dividend sometimes no dividend is paid because investment is required within the firm. So, dividend uh, rate has nothing to do with the cost of capital it is basically the say uh, rate of return required by the equity shareholders and rate of return required by the equity shareholders is more than the normal interest rate because they want some premium for the risk which they are taking by investing their funds into the equity capital of the companies. Third misconception is retained earnings are either cost free or uh, cost significantly uh, less than the external equity. It is a cost free or the cost is significantly lesser than the external equity this is also not correct. It is not cost free first of all it is having the sufficient opportunity cost it is having the sufficient opportunity cost because we assume it that retained earnings if are not invested into any investment proposal they will be distributed to the equity shareholders and equity shareholders will invest those say, uh, uh, say uh, retained earnings as per their own liking and the required rate of return. So, it has the opportunity cost and uh, almost you can treat it as it is having the say, uh, say cost as equal to the external equity. So, how much return is expected by the new shareholders uh, while issuing the external equity same uh, is the cost of the free reserves or the retained earnings. So, retained earnings are not, not free of cost it should be treated as the source having the same cost which is the cost of the external equity being issued a fresh share premium has no cost this is again a wrong notion because every rupee which the firm owns and going to invest in the business has the opportunity cost. If it is not invested in the proposed project it will be invested elsewhere or it will be say used in some very useful manner because it is the money which belongs to the business and every penny in the business has the opportunity cost. So, it means neither the retained earnings nor the share premium has any kind of the say, say source or they are not the kind of the source which are free of cost they are have the equal uh, say importance uh, like all external and internal sources of, of the funds and the cost has to be has to be calculated uh, accordingly depreciation has no cost it again a wrong uh, uh, wrong notion depreciation has no cost. Now, finally, the amount of depreciation which is collected by debiting the amount of depreciation in the profit and loss account since it is a non cash expense. So, this amount comes back again to the firm and this amount is uh, say kept safe and has to be used for reinvestment purpose means number one at the time of the replacement of the asset we will be making use of this money. But in any case for example, that replacement is not required or that replacement has not to be done because it may be possible that by the time the 
say technical value or the usefulness of the fixed assets will become zero or it will, it will go out of say uh, uh, usable life, uh, we will dismantle the project. Project itself has the life equal to the life of fixed assets. So, it means this amount will be distributed to the equity shareholders. So, if this amount is to be distributed to the owners of the company, why not it has a cost? It has the same opportunity cost, they can invest it somewhere else and earn the desired rate of return. So, it is also not free of cost. Next is the cost of capital can be defined in terms of accounting based measures. No, it is not accounting based measures. In the accounting based measures when you talk about, you debit the say profit and loss account with the uh, say interest cost. It is not an accounting measure. Number one, cost of equity you never show in the accounting records and only the cost of debt we show in the profit and loss account debit side that is the interest cost. But, but, but I am talking to you is that cost of capital is not simply the interest cost required by the equity shareholders. It is the interest plus some premium required for the invest, uh, risk they are taking for making this investment in the business. So, in that situation it has to be something more than the interest cost. So, it cannot be only a accounting uh, measure or accounting based measure. Next thing is a company must apply the same cost of capital to all the projects. We have practically seen in the previous classes to all the projects, we have seen it practically that the company cost of capital is, it is, dif is different and the project cost of capital is different because the risk profile of the company and risk profile of the project is not same. So, if different projects are going to be undertaken by the company, they cannot be say uh, applied the same cost of capital because risk profile of every project being different, we have to treat it as an independent investment uh, say entity and we have to say calculate the cost of capital depending upon the amount of risk associated to that, uh, that, that, that project. So, it means the cost of capital for the company is different, for the project is different. And the last one is that if the project is uh, financed heavily by debt, its WSEC is low. If it is financed heavily by the debt, its WSEC is low. It is a very contentious issue that if the project is financed heavily by the debt, its weighted average cost of capital is low. So, this issue is not very simple you can call it as, if it is given there, it is not as simple as it looks because a lot of debate has happened in the past. And this question I will be in a position to answer in the next topic which I am going to start after this uh, say completion of discussion on the cost of capital and that topic is the capital structure which I am going to start. So, in that topic this question has been answered very clearly. Uh, initially when the proper organized theory on the capital structure was not there and we, we, we assume that first organized theory was given to us by the Morgellani and Miller in 1958. Before that we had the unorganized thoughts you can call it as about the say uh, you call it as the uh, cost of equity and the cost of debt different approaches were there, but they were not the mathematical approaches. So, the real thinking was started with the say pronouncement of the theory on the capital structure, first theory on the capital structure in their seminal work by Morgellani and Miller who gave the first theory in 1958. So, they uh, in the beginning like other theories on the capital structure, they also agreed in the beginning that the cost of capital uh, or maybe the say the value of the firm does not depend upon the capital structure because both the sources internal as well as exter external have the same uh, cost. And uh, if you say that that is cheaper than equity, then it is not correct that that is say cheaper than equity it is not correct, but now the latest now the say established outcome is of the different researches and the different uh, say analysis on the capital structure as well as on the different sources of the finance that yes this misconception is that yes debt is cheaper uh, not heavily cheaper. If the project is financed heavily by the debt its WACC is low yes it will be comparatively low because debt, debt has the tax deductible advantage which is not there with the equity. So, I agree that this misconception is not a misconception, it is a agreeable point that yes, even the 
all the theories now the latest theories of the capital structure also have proved it that if the debt component in any company's capital structure is more then certainly the overall cost of capital is going to be lesser. Initially it was not agreed even by the Modigliani and Millers also initially they agreed that uh, say uh, there is one approach in the capital structure which I will discuss with you after this completion of uh, discussion that is a net operating income approach. Net operating income uh, approach uh, says that uh, the, the cost of debt and cost of equity is same and overall cost of the capital of the firm is not affected by having the different proportions of the debt and equity because cost of both the sources is same. So, uh, same, same was the case uh, was the uh, theory which was propounded by Modigliani and Miller capital structure theory in 1958. They also agreed that yes the capital structure does not affect the firm's value, but now the latest thought is that yes capital structure makes a difference and if the debt component in the capital structure is high certainly the overall cost of capital of the firm comes down and it helps to say maximize the value of the firm right. But here we have to take into consideration so many factors that when debt comes in the say capital structure of the firm it brings lot of risk right. So, the cost of capital is, is comparatively lower, but the risk element goes up. So, uh, we have to be very careful while deciding about the debt component in any investment uh, proposal and uh, simply if we look at that because it has that say, say tax deductible advantage. So, a uh, heavy uh, debt oriented capital structure should be created for the project that is not going to be the say true or the say, say, say you can call it as the rational thing. So, Certainly, the weighted average cost of capital will be low if the uh, say element of the debt is high uh, in the in the capital structure of the firm, but it has to be discussed or to be taken into account by considering so many other factors and one important factor is the risk factor. So, uh, these are some misconceptions which I discussed with you in the summarized form quickly. Uh, uh, for the detailed reference detailed uh, learning about these misconceptions and for the other important concepts of the cost of capital also again you can refer to any good book on the financial management. Uh, so, many books are there in the market you can buy I have given 4 or 5 books in my course plan also, but the book which I am following for all this discussion if you buy that I think most of the doubts will be clear and that book is the financial management by Prasanna Chandra. So, remaining discussion or for any kind of the doubts and the detailed reference you can refer to the book as I told you that is the financial management by Prasanna Chandra. So, now with this I close the discussion on the cost of capital and now after this we will move forward with the next part and the next part is uh, is, is, is a very important component of the overall financial management and that component is the, the, the capital structure. Now, I will discuss the capital structure in detail and uh, after learning about the capital structure and the impact of the capital structure on the value of the firm, you would understand that what is important importance of the cost of capital and how it impacts the say capital structure of the firm and what are the different sources of the funds, what is the cost associated to them, how that can be taken into account while determining the capital structure of the firm. So, now let us learn in detail about the next important topic, next important component that is the capital structure and the firm value. So, capital structure and firm value is a very interesting uh, topic, it is a very interesting area and the area of long debate. Uh, where uh, the financial uh, experts uh, for many years even today also sometimes this thought comes in the mind of many uh, financial experts that is there any importance of the capital structure in the uh, say, uh, say overall uh, say capital structure of the firms so, should be bother about that uh, from where the funds should come in the businesses whether they should come from the debt or they should come from the equity or if we raise the funds more from the debt or less from the equity. So, is it going to be any impact upon the say cost of the capital because ultimate objective of every business or any business or any business activity is the maximization of the value of the firm. And the firm's value will be maximized if the total cost of production including financial cost is as low as possible. 
because in today's scenario if you want to increase the profitability of the business uh, it's not possible to increase the profits by increasing or jacking up the selling price of the product or the services the moment you increase the say uh, selling price of the product or services people may even stop buying the product or service because it may be go uh, out of their reach right so what you have to do is you have the second strategy available with you and that is reducing the cost of production and when you talk about the cost of the production financial cost makes a lot of difference here so uh, we talk about uh, say how to deal with the financial cost or cost of capital so what we discussed in the previous say uh, number of classes including in this class also something about the uh, cost of capital so now we are going to uh, talk about that that in the practical sense how the cost of capital matters and uh, uh, capital structure when we talk about or when we think the cost of capital in terms of the capital structure uh, because ultimate focus is upon the uh, something which is called as the firm value right this is the focus and this is the ultimate objective of uh, any any financial management process or any financial management uh, let's say uh, exercise so it means uh, we can say that uh, capital structure and firm value if this topic is given here and all the times when we talk about the capital structure we always remember about the value of the firm right so it means there must be some relationship of the capital structure with the value of the firm and that too in terms of the cost of capital right so uh, let's discuss in detail that what is the capital structure what is the cost of capital that we have already talked about we have learned about and what is the capital structure and how the capital structure affects the cost of capital and ultimately say contributes in the maximization of the firm's value so uh, let's uh, first understand the some relevant uh, say uh, concepts or uh, in a way i can say let's answer some of the relevant questions all right first we will answer some of the relevant questions then you will be able to understand that how capital structure uh, or its importance is building up or is so important to learn about the concept of the capital structure being a student of finance or the financial management right so first question here is what is the relationship between the capital structure uh, and firm's value what is the relationship between the capital structure and firm's value so this is the relationship between capital structure and firm's value this is the million dollar question second question what is the relationship between the capital structure and the cost of capital is there any relationship now what is the question that is there any relationship what is the relationship between the uh, say capital structure and firm value and what is the relationship between the capital structure and cost of capital so it means when we are asking these questions so you should get an idea that yes there is a relationship between the capital structure and firm's value there is a relationship between the capital structure and cost of capital and third important question is valuation and cost of capital are inversely related valuation and cost of capital are inversely related because if the cost of capital is high value of the firm will come down and if the value of the firm has to be taken as high as possible you have to manage the cost of capital so it is certainly a inverse relationship and we have to understand that if you want to increase the overall value of the firm then you have to control the cost of capital so whether capital structure plays any role in lowering down the say a uh, cost of capital that we are going to learn in this entire discussion in the next few classes then different views about capital structure yes there are the different views about the capital structure but now if you talk about uh, say the era till, till 1958 when the first theory was uh, systematic theory mathematical theory was propounded by two financial uh, economist modigliani and miller till then you can call it as different views were there and even modigliani and miller were also not clear whether there is any relationship between the say capital structure and the cost of capital capital and the firm value or not in their first theory as i told you just now that they also rejected the hypothesis that capital structure impacts the value of the firm but later on they came out with the second uh, proposition and in the second proposition they have themselves agreed that yes if the debt component in the company's capital structure is higher then certainly the cost of capital goes down and it adds to the value maximization of the firm 
right. So, these are four important questions which we will like to answer in the subsequent discussion and we would like to know about that how to say decide the capital structure the best and the optimum capital structure of the firm and how to maximize the value of the firm. Now, here we talk about the assumptions, here we talk about the assumptions and uh, the assumptions are like uh, first one is to examine the relationship between capital structure and cost of capital the following simplifying assumptions are commonly made. The following say simplifying assumptions are commonly made because if you do not take these assumptions, if you do not make these assumptions, if you do not assume anything and if you assume that say a dividend is also paid as per the policy of the firm, if you say that taxes impact the uh, overall cost of capital and the value of the firm, if you say that say uh, the firm is having the different profitability situation then what is going to happen? In that case no say you can call it as acceptable answer is going to be available. So, when we are going to talk about the capital structure and its impact upon the firm's value, we are going to say that we are going to assume certain preconditions and these certain preconditions are first condition is no income tax that firm has not to pay though they are most impractical uh, assumptions. But when we say add means or you can call it as remove these assumptions then the capital structure start dwindling. But if you say we, we have assumed a very plain situation no hurdles are, hurdles are there no say different situations are there and if we have assumed all these things how the capital structure will be decided and whether that capital structure will have any impact on the firm's value or not. So, first is the no income tax first assumption second is 100 percent dividend payout whatever the profitability is there with the firm there is no retention of the profitability and whatever the firm earns that is paid as the dividend. Third is investors have identical subjective probability distribution of operating income subjective probability distribution of the uh, say operating income that uh, say between the say distribution of the operating income between the debt suppliers or the lenders and the equity shareholders everybody understands that depending upon the risk and return of the firm how much or which part will go to the debt uh, suppliers or to the lenders how much will come back to the equity shareholders all the investors have the identical uh, say subjective uh, probability or their distribution is known to the all the almost all the investors. No growth firm is stable there is no increase in the profitability there is no decline in the profitability firm is operating at the same level in the form of a straight line means you cannot say that there is a situation something like this or this situation like this firm is moving like this the profitability is moving like this. So, it means there is uh, no growth we have not assumed any growth here and no transaction cost no transaction cost that when you raise the funds you have not to pay any transaction cost or sometime when you have the surplus you invest in the market or when you convert that say, say security into the cash no transaction cost has to be paid. So, these are the five important assumptions have been taken here or taken into account and on the basis of these assumptions we are going to now proceed further that if these assumptions are so held held true or if these assumptions hold good then how the capital structure will be decided. Now focus of analysis this is the focus of analysis is here first of all we will learn about the say the process of calculating the cost of individual sources of funds then we will say learn how to calculate the say overall cost of the firm or the cost of say uh, you can call it as the, the cost of the capital uh, for the firm and then uh, we will uh, apply these uh, say uh, focal points uh, to different uh, discussion points or in the different theories or in the different processes. So, uh, here when you talk about the uh, different sources of the funds we talk about here is that is the debt capital equity capital and RA is the overall capitalization rate that is the uh, you can call it as the weighted average cost of capital R is basically the weighted average cost of capital. So, how we calculate the cost of debt cost of debt is basically I oblique D. So, I is basically I represent the interest part and D represent the market value of the debt. So, it is written here as annual interest charges divided by the market value of the debt and how we calculate the cost of equity 
cost of equity is that is the say equity earning p means the payout ratio and payout ratio decides how much is going to be to be paid out of the profit which part of the profit or how much part of the profit is going to be paid to the equity shareholders and then e is the market value of the equity right and o is the so it means this is the cost of debt this is the cost of equity and this is the overall ra is the overall capitalization rate of the firm which depends upon the or which is calculated with the help of this thing and this if you look at it is same thing what we discussed in the cost of capital ra is basically the weighted average cost of capital so ra uh, is uh, to be decided with the help of how operating income divided by the market value of the firm so it is the operating income divided by the market value of the firm so it means finally ra you can call it as ra is going to be calculated ra is basically the weighted average cost of capital and uh, how we are going to calculate the weighted average cost of capital here that is uh, depending upon uh, the component of debt the component of equity so what we are saying this rd is the cost of debt and this is the proportion of the debt in the total capital structure and this is the cost of equity re multiplying multiplied by this the proportion of equity this is e divided by total capitalization that is a debt plus equity so finally the product of this becomes ra and ra is the weighted average cost of capital which will be say uh, uh, say depending upon the say uh, operating income and the market value of the firm so uh, the weighted average cost of capital can be calculated if we know the cost of debt if we know the cost of equity and their respective proportions in the capital structure from here we now say say raise the issue or this question that uh, if there is no uh, difference in the cost of the two if the debt and the equity are available at the same cost then why not to bring the 100% debt in the firm or why not to bring 100% equity in the firm or why should we bother about or why there is a stipulation that debt equity ratio has to be 2 is to 1 then any debt equity ratio can be had why people think about that we have to go for debt we have to go for equity the proportions have to be like this so it means there must be some reason that is why the weighted average cost of capital is calculated and the proportions of the different sources of the funds in the capital structure are 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 worked out and decided accordingly right now we move to the next important part after talking about the basics of the capital structure we move to the different approaches different approaches which have tried to answer the questions pertaining to the deciding of the capital structure of the firms but these approaches three approaches we are going to discuss initially which are called as the unorganized uh, frequent uh, uh, say uh, fragmented approaches of uh, say is the capital structure first approach is the net income approach then is the net operating income approach and third one is the traditional approach these approaches were available or were being uh, say accorded lot of importance when the say standard theory the say systematic theory of the capital structure uh, given for the first time by the Morgan and Miller in 1958 was not available till then these three theories fragmented theories were available and some people said that capital structure does not make any difference some people said that yes capital structure makes the difference some people say that yes it makes a difference it may not make the difference so it means they were totally the unorganized thoughts not based upon any kind of the say systematic research or any kind of the mathematical modeling but from the Modigliani Miller's era onwards from 1958 onwards now we have the systematic uh, theories of the capital structure but before we move to the Modigliani and Miller theory we will first have to learn about these three approaches of the capital structure net income approach net operating income approach and traditional uh, approach so that after building the foundation and knowing about that before the Modigliani and Miller but other approaches talk about the capital structure and do these approaches have any importance or carry any importance even the era of today or not so one by one we will discuss these uh, say first three approaches and then we will move to the next uh, fourth approach given by the modigliani or the capital structure theory of the uh, capital structure theory given by the modigliani and millers so all these three approaches and the fourth one given by the Morgulani and Miller, we will discuss in the next class. Till then, thank you very much.